Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to this special evening as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the David Asper Center for Constitutional Rights and celebrate the generosity and vision of its benefactor, our alum, uh, David Asper, who is hiding in the back row, uh, consistent with his very modest but effective uh, leadership. A special thank, uh, th uh, welcome and thank you to our esteemed panelists, uh, the Honorable Thomas Crom Cromwell, formerly of the Supreme Court of Canada, two of our former constitutional litigators and residents, Mary Eberts and Joseph Arbe. Arbe, I'm looking forward to uh, a lively conversation, as I'm sure you are as well. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So I'm proud that David Asper is an alumnus of this faculty. Uh, he's done a lot of different things in a distinguished career. He was a lawyer who successfully represented David Milgard in overturning uh, one of Canada's most notorious wrongful conviction cases. But he's also a business person, a philanthropist, and a community leader in a variety of different ways. The variety of the ways that he's contributed is reflected in the variety of ways that he's been recognized. My guess is there weren't many, but there might have been others, but there wouldn't be many people who have both received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for his volunteerism, and is also a member of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers Hall of Fame. That is an exclusive double club. Uh, he's a great supporter of this law school, and we're uh, tremendously grateful for his continued generosity. In 2007, as the panel over there uh, acknowledges, he made what was then the single, lar la single largest individual donation in the history of the faculty, seven and a half million dollars. That not only established the Asper Center, but it essentially kick-started the building campaign which resulted in this lovely building that we are sitting in here tonight. Today, today we celebrate not only the incredible success of the Asper Center, but also David's continued and remarkable support. He's recently generated another two and a half million dollars to the Faculty of Law to both support the Asper Center and the Campaign for Excellence Without Barriers and a bursary for our students. David, thank you very much for your generosity. The David Asper Center for Constitutional Rights is one of a kind. Uh, there's no other constitutional advocacy center in this country where law students conduct legal research, learn and work on constitutional cases, cases in a clinic with some of the leading practitioners in the constitutional bar. The center has collaborated with many leading thinkers from this university and from across the country and has written on the state of Canada's democracy, the role of unwritten constitutional conventions, and how the Canadian government works. It has made submissions to the government committees on legal issues ranging from the privacy rights of jurors and various amendments to the criminal code. The center's hosted a number of outstanding constitutional litigators and residents, residents sorry, seven in total now, to engage their expertise with our students and to enable that kind of invaluable hands-on learning that our students get from working with them on these significant cases. So we have experienced uh, barristers such as Joseph Arve and uh, Mary Eberts, our guests here tonight but also John Norris, Rajanan, Janet Miner, Brees Davies, and our current resident, Susan Ursell. Two, uh, most recently, uh, Mary and Joe received Orders of Canada. Another two were recently appointed to the bench, Justice John Norris to the Federal Court, and Justice Brees Davies to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. What a privilege for our students to get a chance to work with people like this. Centers on university campuses are not preordained successes. Uh, Nearly, uh, I would say, I don't know what the ratio is, but a good, num good number flounder uh, after their founding. For them to work, there's a lot of things that need to go well, but they need really three key ingredients. They need a clear vision, they need resources, and they need strong leadership. All have contributed to the success of the Asper Center. David Asper's passions for the rights of Canadians provided the center with a clear vision. After the cancellation of the Federal Court Challenges uh, Program, which occurred during his graduate studies, David Asper stepped up, conceptualized the, it's the replacement for that uh, program, and hit the ground running with the Asper Center within a year. Moreover, with his original and with his most recent gift, David has provided the center with resources that have enabled its success. 
And then finally, no center succeeds without day-to-day -day leadership. There's that vision. But Cheryl Milne has provided outstanding leadership to the center from its inception. Uh, and we are celebrating her contributions tonight as well. One extremely important role that the center plays that I think is in many ways due to Cheryl's vision is the role that it plays as an intervener in constitutional cases. The center has intervened at, a, at all levels of court on a number of important issues of the day and has indeed appeared before the Supreme Court of Tan Canada 20 different times as an intervener. That's a testament to her vision but also to her energy and to some of the great partners that we have up here uh, and also our students. So thank you, Cheryl, for your great work and congratulations. So with a final thank you to all those, especially David Asper, who made this uh, center such a great success, uh, I'd like to invite Cheryl to say a few words as part of the celebration. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody to our 10th anniversary event. It's hard for me to believe that it has been 10 years, but when I look at what we have accomplished, I'm not that surprised. Dean Yakabuchi has already spoken about the highlights of the work of the center over this past decade, so I need not repeat them. But I want to talk about two things of which I am most proud. First are the accomplishments of the students and alumni of the program. I was in the Supreme Court last week on behalf of the Asper Center and was witness to the excellent submissions of one of the first graduates of the Asper Center's clinic. Megan Savard was there representing the Criminal Lawyers Association in the Barton Appeal. While we were not necessarily on the same side, I could not help but be impressed by her confidence and expertise before the court. This past year, we gave another alumnus of the program the opportunity to represent us in the case of Frank and Canada. Lewis Century made his first appearance representing oral argument on our behalf on a constitutional case involving the rights of non-resident voters. I hope that we will see many more such moments as our alumni grow in number and experience. It was seeing Lewis in this role initially as co-counsel um, and then thrust into the role of lead um, that planted the seed of a new program that we hope to continue in order to give alumni experience working on our cases with senior counsel. I am grateful for Joe Arvey, Arve, Arve, who has just um, who got us started on the Constitutional Litigator in Residence program. He approached us with the proposition that he be resident with the Asper Center, and from this successful partnership, um, grew the program whereby we have brought in the seven Constitutional Litigators in Residence. Dean Yakibuchi has already spoken of this program and the people involved in glowing terms. I have enjoyed working with each and every one of them. The time and mentorship that you have given to the students in the clinic and to me have been extremely valuable. Before I introduce our speakers, I wish to thank a number of people who have contributed to the work of the center and who, many of whom are also here. First, thank you to Tal Schreier, who's somewhere in the back, um, the center's program coordinator. <laughs> she has taken care of today's event and she works closely with our student working groups. And it's through David's generosity that we were able to, to hire a program coordinator and expand the work that we're doing with the students. Secondly, the Asper Center Advisory Group, which has included faculty members, including for this year, professors Lorraine Weinrib, Yasmin Dawood, Richard Stacey, Anna Sue, and our intrepid chair, Kent Roach, um, have been a tremendous support to the program and to me. We have also included an adjunct faculty member and a practitioner in this group. And I wish to thank Paul Shabas, Justice John Norris, and this year's member, who has yet to get started, um, Nader Hassan, for their volunteer time with the center. And finally, I must thank David Asper for his generous support for the center. He has been truly committed to the long-term viability of the center, and through his most recent donation, has effectively guaranteed its future. On behalf of the faculty and students, I can't thank you enough. Now on to brief introductions of our speakers. We have today two of our constitutional litigators in residence who also happen to be two of the most prominent and experienced constitutional lawyers in this country. Mary Eberts received her legal education at Western and the Harvard Law School and is a member of the Bar of Ontario. She joined a Bay Street law firm after several years of teaching at this faculty 
and was a partner at that firm until opening a small firm specializing in charter and public law litigation. She was the founder, or one of the founders, um, of the Women's Legal Edu Education and Action Fund and was active in securing the present language of Section 15 of the Charter. Recognition of her, of her work includes the Law Society Medal, the Governor General's Award in honor of the Persons case, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, and several honorary degrees. In 2017, Mary was made an Officer of the Order of Canada, and she is currently a Senior Fellow at Massey College here at U of T. Joseph Arve, who co-founded the firm of Arve Finlay Barristers in 1990 with offices in Vancouver and Victoria, is recognized as one of this country's most highly respected lawyers. His practice emphasizes constitutional and administrative law matters, as well as Indigenous rights litigation. He has been counsel in scores of important Supreme Court of Canada cases. His exceptional commitment to human rights in this country has been recognized with numerous awards and tributes. He was awarded honorary doctorates of law from both York University and the University of, of Victoria. And in 2017, he also was named an officer of the Order of Canada, as well as a member of the Order of British Columbia. And I think I understand that that was when um, Mary and, and Joe actually got to know each other a little better when they went, went to get the awards together. To give you a sense of the impact that Joe and Mary have had on constitutional law in Canada, um, you need to know that between the two of them, they have appeared at the Supreme Court of Canada in over 50 constitutional appeals. It is no surprise that they have both earned the Order of Canada this year. Their conversation will be moderated by former Supreme Court of Canada Justice Thomas Cromwell. The Honorable Thomas Cromwell received law degrees from Queens and Oxford, practiced law in Kingston and Toronto, and taught law at Dalhousie University. After serving as Executive Legal, Legal Officer to the Chief Justice of Canada from 1992 to 1995, he was appointed a judge of the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal in 1997, serving there until his appointment as a judge of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2008, where he served until 2016. In 2017, he was named a Companion of the Order of Canada for his illustrious service as a Supreme Court Justice and for his leadership in improving access to justice for all Canadians. And so I will now turn things over to our moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. And before I start questioning these folks, I've questioned them in the past, but in a different setting. Um, I'm also excited to be doing a fireside chat in the presence of a real fireplace. Uh, I've done many, and I think this is the first one, so I'm, it's a thrill. But it's a true pleasure and honor uh, to take part in this celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Asper Center, um, and in particular to have the opportunity to speak to two such experienced and committed uh, lawyers who've contributed so much to the development of our constitutional law. I was very uh, grateful uh, for, as a consumer, to some of the work of the Asper Center for my eight years on the court. And I express, express my appreciation to you for that. But I'd also like to celebrate the clinical education component uh, of the center, which I think is extremely important. I think that clinical experience for law students provides them with one of those apprenticeships in law of which the Carnegie Foundation spoke in its important report on legal education. And not only uh, is enriching for the students, but also allows them to serve society much more effectively and knowledgeably as they join the profession. So I wanted to really underline the, the clinical experience for students that you provide, as well as the, the help, help for judges and courts uh, at many levels. So to the Asper Center, let me simply say bravo and encore. So let's get at it. Um, I expect all I'll have to do is ask about one question, and these two will take over. Uh, and I have no amber or red light to defend me, so, or let alone any RCMP officers. So, uh, so we'll get at it. Uh, you both have been tremendous uh, and long-time advocates of, for equality. And so I thought that was a logical place to start. And if I could start with you, Mary, I know that you were involved in efforts to make sure that equality rights were recognized in the Charter as it was being developed. And I wondered if you could think back and share with us a little bit about what your expectations or at least hopes were as you were doing that work, and then 
let us know to what extent you think those hopes and expectations have been realized. I think one of the major hopes that we had was that uh, the guarantees of equality in the Charter of Rights would cover the substance of the law and not merely the procedure of the law. It had been disappointing that the Supreme Court of Canada uh, ruled that the equality before the law guarantee in the uh, Canadian Bill of Rights was only about procedure. We uh, were forced to accept the idea that there would be a three-year delay in the coming into effect of Section 15 because governments were going to busy themselves inspecting the law and passing remedial legislation. Well, that didn't happen. I think they passed maybe a couple of pieces of uh, legislation changing the Shipping Act or something like that. But uh, for the most part, we have had to litigate in order to fulfill the promise of the equality guarantees. And that is not what we expected. We expected that governments would have a much more fulsome commitment to legislating uh, equality rather than just leaving everything to be decided in the courts. Thank you. Now, I know you both were involved in Andrews, which we still reach back to as one of the foundation stones of the equality jurisprudence. Maybe I'd like to get you both to speak about this, but maybe turn to Joe first. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to be part of Andrews and your reflections on what has happened since? Well, uh, Andrews was a very... Um, important. Can, can you all hear back there? The acoustics in this room are, is a little <laughs> challenging, aren't they? Um, it was a really important case to me. I was at the Attorney General's, uh, Ministry of the Attorney General in British Columbia when Andrews arose. And I was always quite self-conscious as a uh, so-called left-to-center lawyer at the time, anyway, acting for the government um, in, um, in charter cases. But I got there literally at the dawn of charter litigation, and that was in um, it was in 1982. I didn't I, I when I I got hired by the Constitutional Administrative Law section, and to do constitutional law, I got hired in November, and I thought I was basically going to be doing federalism cases. You know, as are chickens provincial or are the are eggs federal or whatever? You know, and. I had no idea this thing about the charter, and all of a sudden it's April 1982, and this charter comes down, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thrust into charter litigation. Uh, I'd gone to Harvard, so I knew something about a Bill of Rights that uh, made me sort of like the, the, the local specialist in it. But anyway, um, I, was, I was still kind of conscious about, self-conscious about sort of acting for government in uh, opposing sort of, you know, minorities um, who would bring, bring charter challenges. But at that time, there weren't any minorities bringing charter challenges. There was Big, Big M Drug Mark, there was Irwin Toy, there was uh, uh, you know, Big Pharma, um, uh, Big Tobacco. Those were the cases that, um, that were being brought. And um, I became a student of uh, Dean, uh, and I say that in a kind of a figurative sense, I became a, a close follower of the writings of uh, people in the United States who were writing about sort of judicial philosophy, such as Dean John Hart Eli and, and others, and they gave me some real comfort that I could be a good person by um, defending government laws, not because of the substance of the laws, which I necess didn't necessarily agree with, but because I, that was a rule for the, there was an important rule for the courts in kind of um, making sure that the political process didn't dysfunction so as to sort of trounce on the rights of, 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 um, of minorities. And so when Andrews came along, I actually argued it in the Court of Appeal, and it was Justice McLaughlin who was in the Court of Appeal at the time, and I tried to persuade her at that time that we should put a limit on Section 15, that, that it should be um, uh, not just enumerated ground, but analogous, analogous grounds, and don't open it up to any and all kinds of uh, distinctions, because I looked down to the United States and I saw that you know there were people who were bringing uh, four, 14th or equality rights challenges there because they were manufacturers of aluminum cans rather than plastic, and that was a distinction. 
And so I, I became, you know, quite um, enamored with the idea of trying to limit Section 15, not because I was actually trying to protect governments from having their, their law sort of um, uh, uh, challenged per se, but I was trying to uh, fend off corporations and whatnot, groups that didn't deserve charter protection, who would be using Section 15 um, for the wrong purpose. And so I spent, I, I, although I had to defend the law about lawyers having to be citizens, I didn't really care much about that point, quite frankly, although I had fun researching Aristotle who talked about, you know, lawyers should be citizens, and, and I made the pitch that, you know, lawyers should be citizens, but I was really there to try to um, develop the jurisprudence uh, so that it was um, going in the right direction. And um, I, I know Mary actually takes most of the credit for that decision, <laughs> but I, 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 uh, I, I helped a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, reflections on Andrews. May I say more? <laughs> um, uh, the first three years of the life of Section 15, after we got over the, the delay, was indeed full of litigation by my favorite, actually I thought Joe was going to mention it, by, uh, you know, makers of aluminum pop cans challenging the preferred position of makers of steel pop cans. That was a good one. Um, and there was a terrific uh, paper done by Sheila Day and Gwen Brodsky detailing all of this and um, saying, let us just please use Section 15 for advancing the rights of the disadvantaged. That's what it was meant to be for. And, uh, when, and we established LEAF on the uh, premise that we wanted to do litigation to advance the rights and the position of disadvantaged persons, uh, mainly women, uh, under Section 15. And for me, and I think for a lot of us, sec the Andrews case was the Rubicon. If the court was prepared to accept that Section 15 was to advance the rights of the disadvantaged. And if the court was prepared to accept that it should have a substantive impact rather than just a procedural impact, then we foresaw a future for equality litigation under Section 15. But if the court was not prepared to accept those two principles, then we thought we might as well just close up shop and go away, maybe find jobs, you know, working for makers of aluminum foil or something like that. And I can remember uh, Ontario was changing its rules of civil procedure uh, at the time and I had gone away to a very nice resort in southwestern Ontario to uh, learn the rules of civil procedure. Study in the morning, ski in the afternoon, that uh, worked for me. And somebody phoned and said, the decision in Anders is coming down. Well, you can imagine in those days, fax machines uh, didn't use ordinary paper. They used all that stuff that came out in rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls, and it was all shiny, and the print smeared. So there I was uh, one afternoon in the tiny, tiny office of this, you know, big lodge, with the paper coming out of the fax machine covering me, curdling around me for the, and I was trying to find the decision, what did they say, what did they say? And finally I found it, and it was McIntyre's judgment, and you know, I started cheering, and I started crying, because I thought, now we have a future. And aside from that, you know, I, don't, I didn't know what we were going to do, because we were very keen on having an entrenched charter, because years and years and years of lobbying governments to do the right thing had proven somewhat unsuccessful. <laughs> I'm glad that you were saved from a career in the pop can industry. As a, I'm sure <laughs> pop can people are probably glad about that too. <laughs> I'm sure Justice McIntyre would be very glad if you were still with us. Uh, one further question on equality, and this is more jurisprudential in nature. Obviously, Section 15 has been a bit of a tough one to, to nail down over the years. Do you feel that the the jurisprudence has now 
arrived at a, a suitable level of stability? Or do you think there are uh, other structural changes that need to be made to it? And I'll, maybe, Mary, you're sort of on a roll, so why don't we carry on? I think that uh, it is possible to say that the jurisprudence has reached a level of stability after a lot of conflict on the court and, uh, and between factions in the court about what, uh, what should become of Section 15. But I don't think that that stable approach to Section 15 is actually as satisfactory as it could be. Uh, my writing these days is, uh, with my uh, colleague Kim Stanton, is to the effect that um, it is not helpful for the court to approach Section 15 by going directly to the term discrimination and developing a sort of common constitutional law of discrimination, because that's what they've done. We would like to see more attention paid to the meaning of the first four guarantees, equality before and under the law, and the right to the equal protection and equal benefit of the law, because that will give us the shape of what we're talking about. And then instead of just deciding discrimination at large, we can have a more focused inquiry about whether the legislation has actually uh, committed a wrongful discrimination. So we would like to, we welcome the stability, but we would like to see a bit more complexity and sophistication in the test. Well, my experience uh, litigating um, under Section 15 is sort of mixed. Um, as many of you know, I did a lot of work you know, for the you know, gay and lesbian community, and we had great success in the early days. <clears throat> and I actually remember my submission in Egan and Nesbitt, which was the first Section 15 case um, uh, that established that sexual orientation was uh, an analogous ground. And my submissions were like so simple. Um, they were, um, Justices, uh, this law draws a distinction between opposite sex couples and same sex couples. That should be an analogous ground. It therefore discriminates. That was it. And that actually um, was the majority decision. It, I mean, I haven't gone back and, and, and read it, but it was really pretty simple. And now when I argue Section 15 cases, which they're not my favorite, um, because judges really, really have a hard time getting their head around it, um, as hard as they try. It's a really, it's, it's not an intuitive provision in the charter, like life and liberty and expression. It's a really difficult concept. And um, I don't know if the, if, if we've reached any point of stability, but um, I, um, I've had some success <clears throat> in, um, in, in Section 15 cases. Um, in the most recent case I did, the solitary confinement case, uh, we succeeded in establishing that the law had uh, violated the uh, Section 15 rights of indigenous, indigenous inmates and, and, um, and the mentally ill. Um, but um, they're hard cases, and I think, the, I, I think the court really struggles with them. And I think they will for a long time. Thank you both. I'd like to move on now to the, another area where you've both been very prominent in your advocacy, and that's the area of Aboriginal and Indigenous rights. And ask each of you to tell us about a case that you think is perhaps the most important in that area and where you see the biggest developments coming. Maybe we'll stick with you, Joe, for the moment. Well, for sure, Chilcotin or Chilcotin um, and Delgamook before it um, are the seminal cases. Um, and, and they just keep coming, you know, the, you know the, uh, mostly under the rubric of duty to consult. It became a pivotal part of the decision, um, setting aside the decision of the National, National Energy Board in the, um, in the Kinder Morgan Pipeline case. Um, I just uh, finished an eight-month trial in Northern Ontario dealing with uh, the treaty, the Robinson-Huron Treaty, and, um, and 
I, I, I think there is a tremendous amount of work that still needs to be done um, giving a, an, an honorable interpretation to those treaties. And I, the area is just exploding. Uh, I don't really know how it's that I could sort of, sort of identify the most important or where it's going. It's just, it's just all, seem, it all seems really important right now. <laughs> Um, I think of the series of cases that has um, uh, given meaning to Section 35. I can't pick out one in particular uh, because there has been a progression uh, of such cases. But ultimately, I think that the uh, meaning that the court has given to Section 35 and the Section 35 test is quite narrow. And it doesn't... Um, really encompass everything that the First Peoples aspire to. Uh, and I'll give you a, an example from Mark Waters' writing. In the case of Connolly and Woolrich, uh, there was a couple who had married according to indigenous custom in Manitoba, as it later became. And then they moved back to Montreal and he remarried and ultimately, the children from the first marriage challenged his bequest to the children of the second marriage. And they were successful in establishing that the marriage between their parents, according to indigenous law, was a valid marriage. And so they inherited his estate. And Mark Waters very uh, importantly points out that that case would not be decided that way under Section 35 because most Indigenous societies had some kind of provision about marriage. And it wasn't the, you know, sort of in, in, a distinctive or integral part of a distinctive society. It was too ordinary to come under Section 35. And so in order to really flesh out what Indigenous nations can be in this country, I think we need to look beyond Section 35 as, as it has been defined in the courts and look at what Indigenous laws were, as John Burroughs and Val Napoleon are doing and Hadley Friedland, and also look to establish what is the position of the emerging Indigenous nations in Canadian federalism. Uh, that, you know, that just looking at the series of cases under Section 35, I don't think it's going to do the necessary job. I'll just uh, uh, supplement that a little bit. The treaty case that we did, um, we put a lot of emphasis on Indigenous law. And it was tricky, you know. We, our, our clients didn't necessarily want um, judges who weren't indigenous deciding what their law was, <laughs> right? That's tricky. At the same time, we wanted the treaty to be interpreted um, from the perspective, from the indigenous perspective, and it wasn't just from the perspective of their culture or their traditions. We wanted it to be interpreted from the perspective of their law. And it was fascinating um, how we sort of walked that line and providing the court with that perspective without necessarily saying to the court, you need to find that this or is or is not indigenous law. It's a, it's a tricky sort of line to walk. But um, it's going to become more and more important, um, I think, in indigenous and First Nations litigation that the the court sort of struggle with and incorporate and under, try to understand um, the and, and and it's and it's not intuitive, you know. In the in the case I did, the, the I, we were active for the Anishinaabe people, and their laws embedded in stories. And you know, the government experts they were trying to be respectful, but they were pretty dismissive. That's not law; those are stories. And um, but you know. So yeah, I, I, if, if, there's a, if, there is, if there's going to be something interesting happening in the future in indigenous or, you know, First Nation litigation, it will be 
how the courts deal with indigenous law. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Is that, is that better? Yeah. No, <laughs> that's better. All right. All right. Um, I can't resist asking you one more question in this, talk, in this area, and that is that, as you know, the Honorable Frank Iacobucci has taken on a little file um, assisting in the, fixing the uh, consultation process for the pipeline. If you had to give Frank one piece of advice, what would it be? I think it would be read the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and take it seriously to heart because the consultation process, I think, in this country uh, says, uh, I, think the, I think the jargon for it is, the Attorney General says it aligns with the UNDRIP, but it doesn't actually allow First Nations to refuse to consent to certain things, whereas under UNDRIP, they can refuse consent. I think that's a really important distinction. Well, I wish uh, Frank all the luck in the world trying to sort of navigate through that quagmire. Um, he better talk to the whales <laughs> because they're holding the trump card right now. <laughs> I don't think you can send Frank any bills for this, but just, just to, to make that clear. I'd like to maybe look a little more at the practices of the Supreme Court with a couple of questions. And you both have been very active over many years acting for interveners as well as for, for parties. And I'd love to get a sense from, from your perspective of the challenges of acting for interveners. And then also, do you, have you sensed any change of attitude on the part of the court towards interveners? And how would you like to see that role evolve? So maybe, Joe, start with you. You don't have, fun. oh yeah, there we go. Um, I happen to be of the view that interveners play a really important role in, in the development of the uh, Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence. And uh, obviously the person who knows if that's true is sitting to my right. Um, but I have, I've been at the court a, a, enough times to know who's really making sense and who's really um, uh, uh, making really good submissions. And it's usually the interveners. And, 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 part of the, and part of the reason for that is that um, the appellants and either the, the main parties, the appellants or the respondents, um, uh, often their lawyers, that's the first and maybe only time they ever go there. And, and that's not to you know, denigrate them in any way, but um, there's a certain style of advocacy in the Supreme Court of Canada that um, um, requires some experience. And, so it's both because I think the, the lawyers for the interveners were almost sort of a Supreme Court bar like they have in the United States. We have our own sort of unofficial one here. I think that they're, you know, they tend to be um, very effective advocates. But the, obviously the interveners themselves, the organizations, bring a perspective to the court that the parties d don't. So I happen to be a, a, a believer in the importance of interveners. And maybe I'll stop there and hand it over to Mary and I'll have a few more thoughts after. Uh, I, too, am a believer in the importance of interveners. It was uh, not lost on us that the uh, decision in law where a very, very complicated uh, tax code of uh, rules for interpreting Section 15 emerged from a Supreme Court hearing where there were no interveners. And uh, so the court did not have uh, any perspective uh, to incorporate into its, its uh, rulings. I agree with Joe about the experience of the organizations and the experience of the council. I think at the moment, interveners are getting kind of short shrift from the Supreme Court because we're only allowed five minutes. What can you say in five minutes? Um, and even though you have a, a factum, um, by the time the factum is digested and passed on to the judges by their clerks, you don't really know if the ideas in the factum have got there. And so I would like to see uh, more uh, uh, oral argument for interveners. And I think another, another important area uh, uh, 
highlighted by the recent Barton decision is uh, that since the advent of the Charter, uh, there has grown up a practice of having interveners at the appellate stage of criminal cases. And it is really, really important for interveners to be there because the Attorney General or the, the government does not represent everyone. I mean, it doesn't represent the victim's interest, doesn't represent a lot of interests that uh, need to be attended to in order to reach a fair decision. And uh, I'm hoping that the court will um, endorse the role of interveners in the criminal process. It's been challenged by the Criminal Lawyers Association. It has existed since the Seaboyer case, and I hope that it's allowed to continue. Just one follow-up question. Do you think that, that there's a, a point of diminishing returns with interveners? I know, for example, in Trinity Western, I think there were 25 or 27 interventions, and they were given, I guess, a succession of five minutes for a whole day. Is that useful uh, to the interveners? The court can obviously decide whether it's useful from their point of view. Or do you see some more kind of structural change to the role of interveners? Well, I think whether it's useful depends on the nature of the interveners bar that jo that Joe mentioned. Because you can actually do a lot if the interveners are cooperative and uh, you have discussions amongst the interveners about who's going to deal with what in the factum and who's going to deal with what in oral argument. And so often you can get a nice riff going of uh, argument uh, if the interveners are cooperating. And I like to see that. I mean, I think the court should um, continue to welcome interveners, but I agree with Mary. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous uh, to go all the way to Ottawa to speak for five minutes. I mean, when I first started doing intervention, it was, I think it was 20 minutes, and then it was 15 minutes, and then it was 10 minutes. And I'm sure next year we're just going to be one minute. <laughs> so I think they should let everybody in and just be a little more uh, ruthless about who they, who they let to speak, and then I'll let those people speak um, for a, a reasonable period of time, and I think it's 15. You can do a lot in 15. You can't do much in five. I'm going to resist asking whether you think that it's any reflection on the uh, Supreme Court bar that the time has continued to go down. But <laughs> <laughs> I will put on the record that I oppose those changes. <laughs> uh, I'd like to change the channel perhaps quite completely and talk a little bit more about the profession for a moment. And both of you at times have been part of quite large law firms and at other times and currently smaller boutique operations. Did you find the large firm setting could, could, could provide a, an appropriate platform for the kind of work that you wanted to do and to which you're so committed? And if you have some reservations about that, are there ways that large firms could make more space for that kind of work in your opinion? Maybe Mary, we'll start with you. Um. I think uh, I will always be indebted to the large firm that I worked in for many years for the spectacular training that I received in how to do large cases. And some of the cases, the rights cases that I've been um, involved in have been very large and they've gone on over a number of years. And without that big firm background, it would be very difficult to kind of learn on the job how to do those cases. I think increasingly big firms have applied the committee method to deciding what pro bono cases they will take on, and that's a bit difficult. It was always more fun when you could sneak a case past some sympathetic senior partner and uh, get it embedded in the, in the roster of cases before anybody else noticed. But, uh, you know, they got on to me on that score very early. Um, but then I think one of the other things that happens in a large firm is that uh, juniors and students love to work on these cases, but uh, they, they really need, they, rash, they should ration themselves because the student and associate who works only on pro bono cases or low bono cases 
does not have a great future in any big firm. And so there's kind of a, you know, a, a, a need uh, for both the uh, partners who encourage that work and also the associates to be careful because they can very easily find themselves in a, a dead end if they have been over-involved in a pro bono case, even though the formal uh, policy of the firm is in favor of pro bono. What happens is that a lot of the partners who are consulted will say, oh, I've never worked with Smith, or I've never worked with DeLuca. Uh, what, what has she been doing all these years? Turns out, you know, been in a big pro bono case. So that's a real risk. Well, I, I had my own firm for 25 years, and then I took a, uh, a leave of absence from it for three years and went and worked for a, a, a big firm for Vancouver, but not big Canada-wide. It was about 100 partners. And, um, I mean, I've always, I've always done a lot of pro bono work, and, and I never had any difficulty having uh, in either the small firm. Um, I didn't have any difficulty in the small firm having the associates work with me on it, but it was a delight for me actually in the big firm because I could, you know, there were so many young associates who wanted to work on these cases. And as long as, and, and as long as, you know, each one only did one, you know, they didn't get in trouble with, you know, the partners in billing. And then I had sort of, you know, uh, you know, it's just sort of an embarrassment of riches, these incredibly young, talented lawyers who would work with me on these cases. And so rather, you know, rather than when in a, in a small firm, you know, when I do, when I do pro bono, it's my, it's my pro bono <laughs> because, you know, I, I, everybody, everybody's my responsibility in a big firm. It's the other partner's pro bono, right? And I can just sort of pick and choose from the associate. But anyway, the more the point, I found that uh, all, the big firms uh, were very supportive of having their young associates um, do these cases. In fact, I think it was sort of a recruitment thing. Come into our firm and, you know, there's partners here who do Supreme Court of Canada work and you'll be allowed to do it. So I, they really try to, I think, market themselves as a, a, a place where um, uh, uh, where they, where the associates are encouraged, not all the time, uh, but you know, spread around. They're, I think they're, they, the big firms. I think really try to mark themselves as places where associates will do that kind of work. Thanks very much. And getting back to the the pro bono aspect, uh, in a way, um, it seems to me that over the last few years, the subject of both advanced costs and special costs have taken on added importance because I think the courts are increasingly aware that you have counsel taking on these huge files that go on forever and wanting to make sure that counsel will do that. Do you find that our law on special costs and advanced costs is satisfactory or do you hope to see some developments uh, in that area? Maybe I'll start with Joe on that. Well, this is a subject very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so, uh, just a little bit of history. Um, I was uh, an inter. I I was the counsel for the Chilcotin, and got them an advanced costs award in the lower court. And Louise Mandel was counsel for the Okanagan Indian Band which got them advanced costs in the lower court. They were the first advanced cost decisions in Canada, um, at least in public interest cases. And um, we both got leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. But for reasons I don't really remember right now, Louise's case, the Okanagan the Indian Band case, was, was sort of perfected first. And um, my clients the, on the style of causes, uh, Roger, Chief Roger Williams, but he was the chief of the Honeyquatine Band, which became the Chilcotin First, which, which is the band of the Chilcotin First Nation, and you know that case. So, um, but because Louise's case got was perfected first, we were interveners in that case as opposed to main parties, and that turned out to be a real stroke of luck because even though I would have liked to have been the main party. 
it turned out, and this is one of the sort of the beauties of being an intervener, Louise's job was to get her client, the Okanagan Indian Band, advanced costs. And of, and of course, she would focus on the fact that this was a, um, a First Nation and this was Aboriginal litigation and it was just, I just want advanced costs for um, my client and, and she would kind of limited her submissions to getting it for, um, you know, uh, uh, Aboriginal lit litigation. Well, I had the beauty of being an intervener. And even though I too wanted to have get uh, advanced costs for my client, I saw this as an incredibly important opportunity, um, probably a little bit self-interested because being a public, you know, doing the kind of work I did. And I made a really strong pitch that the court should allow for advanced costs in all public interest litigation. And one of the happiest days in my career was when the Okanagan, when the Okanagan Indian Band case came down and the court gave, uh, made an order that one could get advanced costs in public interest litigation if there certain criteria were met. Sorry, this is a long answer. I was, I was very excited about this development. I thought, wow, access to justice is going to be really real in charter litigation because we were always begging, borrowing, stealing, and act, basically acting for free in all the cases we were doing. And I remember saying, I remember giving talks at CLEs and I would say to the lawyers, be careful, don't, don't start asking for advanced costs in cases unless you're absolutely sure you're going to get them. We don't want the court to think we're going to abuse this power. I would sort of lecture lawyers, don't do it unless it's the right case. Well, who decided to take the next case? <laughs> that was me. And it was in the context of the Little Sisters litigation. For those of you who know, you know, we spent, you know, I don't know how many years getting the Supreme Court of Canada um, and getting a declaration that customs had misapplied, maladministered the customs legislation. And, uh, but the court wouldn't strike down the law when I asked them to do. They just gave us this declaration. And um, it was Justice Iacobucci who was in dissent and he would have struck down the law. And, and, I, and, and I recall something to the effect that, I don't know whether this was behind the scenes or not, I think he told Justice Binney, don't worry, these guys are gonna be back. No sooner had we got out of court, that custom struck again. And they grabbed, they, they seized two comic books. And they were, called, they, were, they were of the Meat Men series. And, and it didn't make any sense that they would do this in light of what the Supreme Court of Canada did. So we started another action and, and we started again on our own dime and we did discovery and we found out they'd had, they basically lied to the Supreme Court of Canada. They hadn't changed anything. They didn't do anything. And so uh, we thought, why should we have to start a litigation which is the same litigation and do it on our dime? And so we brought an application for an advanced cost order and we brought it uh, um, before Madam Justice Elizabeth Bennett, who this guy knows, and, <laughs> and she gave us this great advance cost order, a great advance cost order, and uh, the, gov the custom, the government appealed at the Court of Appeal, and we got slaughtered in the Court of Appeal. So it was just an ugly decision, and, and my client said, you know, we got to appeal this to the Supreme Court of Canada, and, um, and, and um, so we did, and, and this is a little secret that I've told a few people now, so I guess it's not a huge secret. It was on the eve of going to the Supreme Court of Canada that I got a call from the lawyer for customers saying, how about we do a deal? And I said, what's the deal? And, they said, and she said, well, we'll give you some money. And it was, a pretty good, it was a pretty good chunk of cash. And I went to my clients and I said, what do you think? Do you want to take it? They said, absolutely not. That decision of the Court of Appeal is so horrible. It's going to set back the rights of sort of equality seekers everywhere. We've got to go to the Supreme Court of Canada. We're confident that we'll win there. Well, we got slaughtered in the Supreme Court of Canada. <laughs> And, and then now we've just been kind of crawling back up the mountain and trying to get... So um, I, I, I did get an advanced cost order after that and then it got taken away from me again by the Court of Appeal. Um, I know there's been a few advanced cost orders. They're very rare, they're very hard to get, but you know they're essential um, because the, the, it, 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 without some assurance that you're going to get paid for your work, you know, it's not... 
Interveners are one thing, you know, we can all do pro bono work as interveners, but try starting a case like Little Sisters, try starting a case like Carter, try starting a, any of these cases which, you know, re involve thousands of hours of work. It's, 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 it's sort of disheartening knowing there is no prospect of cost at the end of the day, or, or there is there's at least the possibility of absolutely no cost. It would be so much more encouraging for lawyers to know that they can get costs in advance. Um, and so, yeah, it's incredibly important, but it's a little bit depressing right now. Mary, any reflections on either advanced costs or special costs at the end of the road? Well, uh, I, I have uh, the same kind of depressed feelings about advanced cost orders as Joe does. Uh, I think you really put the client through a lot uh, to uh, in an, any such application because they have to uh, turn out their pockets and tell the court basically that they have no money and and that starts them out at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the other party. What I really like and what I have benefited from in the past is I really like those orders that you can get on an interim basis where the party on the other side has behaved really badly. I like to see the party on the other side behaving really badly because then you can ask for an order of, you know, sort of full indemnity costs or in one glorious case, we actually got um, punitive costs uh, because the party on the other side had behaved like really badly. So I like situations like that. Not that I try to provoke them, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's... <laughs> Perhaps I should quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> Do you see that passion that comes out about costs? So it's, uh, I, I don't know where we pick that up as lawyers, but it, it's, always, uh, it's always there. We're... I had my own small firm. We used to have what we called the Champerty and Maintenance Department, <laughs> which existed in order to try to raise money for our cases. Let's turn for a moment to the Asper Center and then we have a few moments that if, if some people who are here had some things they'd like to raise with you, we have a few moments for that. But to turn to the Asper Center, I think everyone would be interested to know what you had done when you were both uh, involved with the Center directly for your term and also whether you have any advice for the Center going forward. What would you like to see it do in its next decade? Um, Mary, why don't we start with you? Well, uh, the teaching at the Asper Center was actually the last piece of teaching that I did because um, I ran into the uh, rule in the law schools that you have to mark on the bell curve. And I didn't think that it was fair that students who chose to do this and who had to opt in at some cost to them uh, and who were incredibly keen and worked very hard uh, would not have the full opportunity to get a good mark. I was very angry about that and the next year when I went to Osgood, they asked me if I wanted to teach and I asked them about the bell curve and they said, yes, we mark on the bell curve and I said, fine, I won't teach then because I think that's really unfair in a seminar situation and I would like to see law schools change that practice. So as far as um, the Asper Center is concerned, one of the really nice parts about the work is that you get to work closely with the students, and I love doing that. And, um, as far, and I just think the more of that you can do, the better. As far as the uh, professional education at the bar is concerned, I think the Asper Center programs have been fantastic, and I have a special request for two topics in the future. <laughs> One of them is, uh, could we please revisit the whole issue of freedom of expression in the context of political speech? Uh, I've now been in two cases where, you know, some judge has said, well, you know, they can always go stand on the street corner and express their ideas after somebody has been bounced from an established political process, or as recently in Ontario, the city elections were 
uh, sort of a, had a bomb dropped on them by the premier. So can we just please stop sending people to the street corner uh, to express themselves once they've been expelled from a legitimate political process? And the other thing that I think would be really interesting to start exploring is uh, the position of self-governing First Nations in Canadian federalism. It's, it's not a litigation topic, but it's really overdue for a look. And over to you, Joe, but the yellow light is on. <laughs> well, I, 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 I uh, really enjoyed my experience as the uh, first constitutional litigator in residence at Asper. It was uh, such a joy to work with students again. It's been a long time for me. Um, the case that I did when I was there was Bedford. And um, I don't know how transparent my, um, my motives were with Cheryl when we did Bedford, but I had sort of mischief. I, was, I had sort of mischief in mind in intervening in Bedford. Um, because I thought that the Asper Center would be the ideal intervener to argue that the, doc the common law doctrine of stare decisis uh, should be um, a subordinate to the constitutional requirement that if, if a law is inconsistent with the Constitution, then a trial judge has to strike it down. The Supreme Court of Canada be damned. That was sort of my attitude. And, um, and I... <laughs> And, and as Justice Cromwell just said, it wasn't just in that case, <laughs> because I, cause I knew what was coming next was Carter. <laughs> and so um, we intervened, Asper intervened in, uh, in Bedford. In fact, I, I, I had two clients in Bedford. I acted for Asper, but I also acted for um, the, uh, the sex workers of the downtown east side in Vancouver where we developed, we made arguments on the substance of the law, but for us, for our, our whole pitch was that the doctrine of stare decisis um, sh um, sh is no longer quite what people thought it should be, and the Supreme Court of Canada bought our argument and acknowledged it uh, coming from us. Um, now, I think they've regretted that decision ever since, <laughs> because if you read the Save the Beer case, um, They've uh, ratcheted it back and said, no, stare decisis seems to be way more important to us than we were bamboozled by the Asper Center. <laughs> Thanks, and Cheryl, I think we have a, a couple of minutes at least for some questions from or comments from the, uh, those in attendance, so let me turn it over to you. Oh, this one's working. Um, we just have time for maybe a couple questions because we're standing between um, you and some refreshments. We have a reception over in the conference center. So if there's any questions, you'll have to use the mic, so I'll run around and find you. Um, the first one is from our dean. Justice Cromwell, uh, thank you for your questions. But can I ask you one of those questions? What, what do you think? I, I, I'm drawing some inference from what you said about your opposition to the shrinkage of the time. But I'd, I'd be really curious about your perspective on interveners and, and how useful you found them in your experience. I think the, the interveners are very important. And not only from the point of view of the assistance that they can give to the court, which is often considerable, but also from making the process more inclusive, that obviously the highest court in the country, I guess the Americans call an apex court, is going to decide things that will affect a lot of people who aren't before the court as parties. And the interventions, I think, were conceived to uh, give a broader community some input into the decision making. And so I don't, I don't think it's an entirely selfish uh, thing with interveners, and I sometimes fear that, that the court may be losing sight of the fact that having that broader input in itself is important to the process, even, even if perhaps not all the submissions are life-changing uh, in, in their five minutes. Um, I do wonder if we may have, have reached the you know, in terms of numbers of interveners, whether we're kind of getting to the law of diminishing returns, that there might be fewer but with more time, because I completely agree with what, what Mary and Joe were saying, that five minutes is a pretty tough assignment, uh, especially if it's five minutes one after the other for 
you know, a whole day. It's, it's not an ideal situation. And finally, just to underline something, I think it was that Joe said first, is that there's no question that there has developed a kind of intervener's bar that often brings a lot of experience and advocacy skill to a case, um, and certainly not to in any way denigrate the, the role of counsel for the parties, but there is a benefit from having people who are very experienced in Supreme Court advocacy in the court, and I've, it certainly was my experience that often those people could see what was going on and then really z sort of zero in on something that would be of real help to the court. I don't see any other hands up for questions, so um, just ask everybody to um, join me in thanking our speakers. I will take your advice under advisement and we'll talk, Mary. <laughs> but thank you so much.